listen to these words, Revelation chapter 5. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, you are worthy of it all. We thank you for the angels that surround us. We praise you for brothers and sisters in the faith who have walked before us. We thank you, O Lord, for a heritage of individuals who are willing to lay their lives on the line and follow Jesus when he says, if anyone would come after me, then let that individual take up his or her cross and follow me. Lord, you are worthy and we willingly yield ourselves to you. We pray, O oh Lord, for revival. We pray for a mighty movement of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you promised that to anyone who asks, that person will receive. To anyone who seeks, that person will find. To anyone who knocks, that door will be opened. How much more, you say, will the Heavenly Father Give his Holy Spirit to those who ask. So Lord, this morning we ask. We ask not simply for ourselves. We ask for a mighty flow, a flood of the Spirit of the living God across our land. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus. You are worthy of it all. Amen. Over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the names of God in the Bible the character of God that those great biblical names express. We've taken a look at some Hebrew words that ring in the ear and the message they give. It truly does reveal what our God is like and what our God is all about. There's a word that I'd like to share with you this morning. Actually, it's two words. Mayim Chaim. Can you say that? Mayim Chaim. Mayim Chaim. It means living waters. Listen to these words. From the book of the prophet Jeremiah, God himself is speaking, and he says, Has anyone ever heard anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols and things. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, Mayim Chaim. And they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Jesus referred to that very character of the Father. John chapter 7, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Mayim Chaim. John writes, he said this, referring to the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. God desires living waters be poured out of the heart of every human being. He desires revival. And that's what we're going to hear about this morning. That's what we've been praying for. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our sermon illustration this morning. About 45 minutes of sermon illustration, I might add, from a dear sister in the Lord, God has brought to us this morning, I believe, in an incredibly timely fashion. So would you just, you know, we don't usually applaud for the uh, sermon here, but would you applaud for the person who's going to deliver the illustration? Uh, the it is such a joy to have you here. It's a joy to be here. And uh, 
God bless you and use you. May I pray for you? I'd love that. Heavenly Father, pray for our dear sister, Diane. Pray, Lord, that you would continue to anoint her with your Holy Spirit and that you would give her everything that you desire us to receive this morning. We pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified. We pray that we would witness a mighty work in our day, not something that we have done, but something that you have done. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus, who is Lord over all and is coming soon. Amen. God bless you, Diane. Take it away. It's so good to be with you again. Um, how many of you uh, were at church when I was there about a year and a half ago? It was Memorial Weekend. Okay, a little bit before, like two weeks before. So I don't have to give a long introduction for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm from Grantsburg, Wisconsin. It's on the other side of the river. We call it the promised land over there. And so we always say that the Minnesota people on weekends have to cross the river into the promised land. Uh, we especially know that after the football game this last week, right? So I have to rub it in a little, you know. I, what I really should be doing is bringing you lots of cheese from uh, Burnett Dairy to kind of compensate for that. But it's good to be back with you today. Just a brief intro. Um, I grew up there in Grassburg, Wisconsin on a dairy farm. I spent the bulk of my childhood milking cows and driving tractor and throwing hay bales and I paid my way through Bethel College, Bethel University now, through um, cattle that I raised and pigs that I raised. So it was the farm literally that put me through Bethel. And then when I finished at Bethel, I returned back to my home community, Burnett and Polk County, and uh, I led a youth ministry there for 20 years. And so for 20 years, I was in Grantsburg, Frederick, Siren, and Webster every single week. And so it feels really good to be back in school. Um, I spent the bulk of my time from 1980 to 2000 in public high schools. We did not work as a youth ministry through a local church, but rather our hearts were toward the lost kids in the public schools who never darkened the doors of a church and we wanted them to encounter the love of Jesus. So from there, from 2000 up till now, God has had something totally different in store. I never would have guessed this in my wildest dreams, but for the last 20 years I've traveled the world. I've been in 40 different nations. Um, God made it very specific when he talked to me that I want you to go to places where my name is not known. I want to send you to some of the hardest places on earth. Uh, I would like you to go to the poorest of the poor. I want you to be in Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim nations. Anything that ends with ism, communism, spiritism, atomism, Shintoism, Buddhism, that's where I want you to go. And I don't want you to work with white organizations. I mean, it was literally like that clear. And so I'm like, uh, how are we going to do this? Like, I don't have any money, and I don't know where these places are, and I've never even prayed about these places. And God says, you don't have to worry about that. That's my job. Um, it literally, when God calls us to go, he also is one who promises to provide. Because he's not just these two words I can't pronounce. He's also Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And so the last uh, 14 years, I've traveled around the world and I've spent most of my time in what's referred to as the 1040 window. It's 10 degrees north latitude to 40 degrees north latitude from West Africa across to the Philippines. That rectangular window where India, China, the Arab world, um, the Mideast, all of that is there. And that is the window of the world most needy for Jesus. So, that is where I've been the last 14 years, uh, but I was just telling, I think it was Phil this morning, that I was supposed to be going to India, Nepal, and Myanmar in November, and I felt very strongly that God said, I want you to cancel that trip because I need you in America. And I would much rather be in India, Nepal, and Myanmar, to be honest, 
but I feel such, I haven't been able to sleep well for about the last month. I've been waking up at like 2, 3 in the morning, every morning, with this deep unrest for the United States. Just feeling like our window of time is narrow and short. And we must, we must have an awakening. We must have a revival where this country as we know it is gone forever. This country as we know it will be gone. And so um, revival has been stirring in my heart. Uh, and so I'd like to pray too before I share this story. Father, you saw me when I was a young girl illegally climbing the fire tower of my hometown. And even as an 18 year old beginning to cry out to you for revival, not for the world, just for Grantsburg, just for my hometown. And what began to stir at 18 has never stopped. If there's one word I long for, it's revival. I want so bad to see firsthand, to experience firsthand what I've read about. I yearn for that. And so, Lord, would you take this simple message today and use it to awaken all of us now. Awake us now. Awake us from our places of comfortableness, our comfort zones, our, our places of safety, our places of, of just having so much, Lord, but not fully having you. We have all tasted of so many things that have not quite filled us up. We're not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I can't speak for everybody else, but I'm not satisfied with what I've experienced with you. I want more. I want so much more. I want to see your fullness. I want to see your glory. I want to see millions of people saved. Time is short. You are returning soon. And the world is so many lost, billions of lost people. And so we, only your glory can change things. Only a revival, only your Holy Spirit flooding this area, flooding Minneapolis, St. Paul, flooding Minnesota. From here maybe being, we talked about our brother this morning when we prayed the headwaters of the Mississippi. I pray that Awake Us Now would be one of the headwaters of revival in our land. And I dare to ask you for that. And so use this story, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in the Lord's Prayer, there's a great line. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is one powerful, short prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Right here in Richfield. Right here in Bloomington. Right here in Minnesota. Your kingdom come. What would it look like if his kingdom came here? What would it look like if his will was done in this cafeteria? If his kingdom would come not just to make it even more personal, what would it look like if his kingdom came to you, to your life? Lord, you pray, Lord, your kingdom come to me. Your will be done in and through my life. Your will, whatever is written on your blueprint when you created me, when you thought of me, when you designed me and you wrote down, this is what this person's life is for. This is what heaven dreams of for you. What would it look like if his will for your life was done? You lived it. You could say like Jesus when your life was over, I finished the work you gave me to do. There was in our lifetime, for most of us, a village, a community, 
a little island off the northwest corner of Scotland that experienced what it was to see God's kingdom come and his will be done in their vicinity. And it's that story that I want to share with you today. It's a story of the Hebrides Islands. Hebrides Islands are located off the west coast of Scotland. It's a small group, a cluster of islands that is referred to as the Hebrides. Between 1949 and 1954, so a five year window, a revival swept through these islands in an unprecedented way, in an answer to desperate prayers of God's people. God's people had had enough. They were filled up to here with the way life was in the villages of their islands, and they wanted change. So they began to pray, and to pray earnestly and fervently and desperately. I have read over and over again that revivals never happen, that we can't point to any historical move of God that first was not preceded by extraordinary prayer. I don't mean the God is great, God is good at the table prayer, or now I lay me down to sleep prayer. I mean extraordinary prayer, where you just can't pray enough because you want change. That's what happened in the Hebrides Islands um, leading up to 1949 to 1954. People began to pray in extraordinary ways. So this morning I want to introduce you to a very unlikely cast of characters. People that you would never, ever think would be part of a huge move of God. Uh, during a certain window of time, I began to study revival. I spent five years just reading everything I could get my hands on on revival. And the story I'm sharing with you this morning is piecing together these characters that I read in different accounts. And I go, oh, that's, that's this guy or this woman in Hebrides Islands. They also were a part. So this cast of characters is pulled together from different writings and research that I did on what God did at that time. The first stirring that I can find was two elderly women. Their names are Peggy and Christine Smith. Let me introduce you first to Peggy. Peggy's 84 years old and blind as a bat. Can't see her hand in front of her face. She has a sister named Christine. Christine is 82, bent over with arthritis, crippled up, hands, feet, back. Christine can hardly move. These are a couple of old maid sisters, never been married, and they're in a little cottage on the, on, in the village of Barbas. One day they're having coffee at the table and they said, and they're pretty depressed. What in the world are we still doing here? Why hasn't God taken us home? We're worthless. What good are we? I mean, they need each other a little bit. Um, Peggy is blind, so she needs Christine to tell her where stuff is in the cottage. Christine is bent over with arthritis, so she can just um, get Peggy over to her. She can kind of get around a little bit if Peggy can hold her up. But this is a pretty tough situation. So as they're talking at the breakfast table this one morning, they said, well, clearly God isn't letting us die. So perhaps we're supposed to figure out why we're still alive. So they decided that they were going to start praying. Well, at least we can sit in our cottage here and pray. So they begin to pray. And as they prayed every day, their prayer life deepened and broadened and became more specific. So they thought, you know what? Here we are in this little village of Barbas. Let's map out. Let's get a map of our little village and write down every street and who's in every house. And then let's begin to pray for our neighborhood by home by home, name by name. And whatever we know about them or don't know about them, you know how it is in little towns. There's not much to do in a small town, but what you hear makes up for it. You know, it's, um, we have a t-shirt in Frederick. It says, 
what goes, what happens in Frederick on the front, on the back says, goes around in about five minutes. <laughs> and so um, that was the situation of Barbara. So these two old ladies began to pray. And they, they made prayer their job. They prayed for their pastor, Pastor James McKay, Pastor James Murray McKay. And they prayed for him every day. They prayed for their elders. They prayed for the leadership in their church. They prayed for their high school. They just prayed and prayed and prayed. Here was their stake in the ground, and I think it's so interesting, the verse you shared today. You guys need to know, this is not orchestrated by anybody except the Holy Spirit today. I had no idea what passage uh, that pastor was going to share today. I had no idea this theme of living waters. And here is the verse that these women claimed. Isaiah 44, 3. Not Jeremiah. Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Isn't that amazing? That was those, they had, these two ladies had one stake in the ground. Here they are on an island, you guys. They're surrounded by water, but they're knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that their land is parched. You have to see that in the spirit. Because an island surrounded by water, you would not think would be people that would pray that God would pour out water on dry ground. But they were seeing the spiritual condition of their island. That people were dry, spiritually dry. There was no interest in the youth culture of that island. The young people had no interest in spiritual things. And so they were praying that God would pour out spiritual water upon them that were thirsty and would flood their island with his water. About the same time, a band of brothers, I'll call them. It was some guys from the island. They went to their church's annual meeting, this, the Church of Scotland, and they met in a town called Stornoway. And so this was the annual meeting to celebrate their denomination and to talk about the church. But this was a pretty honest one. It was a pretty honest meeting. There wasn't the denominational heads, the leadership of the Church of, of Scotland, didn't have a lot to brag about. And the people that were sitting there knew that. There were guys there from Barbas. So from this island, from the Hebrides Islands, were some men that came from their churches there. And so these group of men actually had some honest discussion at the tables. And they discussed the deplorable, awful conditions of the churches in their district. They said, as bluntly as this, the worldly places are crowded. The theaters, the stadiums, the bars, the shopping centers, they're full of people. But the churches are getting emptier and emptier and older and older. They said the young people have all but disappeared we look around in our churches on a Sunday, we do not see high school and college age. I'm not picking on you, but I don't see a lot of that here today either. It was this that just said, this is awful. The conditions of our churches are awful. Many churches have all but closed the doors, or they should. In 10 years, many of the churches of that time would have been gone simply because of death. People would die off and the church would have to close their doors, but it wouldn't be enough to keep the lights on and pay the bills. So it was this kind of honest discussion that was taking place at this annual meeting. No one dreamed in their wildest dreams that this kind of honesty was going to be one of the, the things that would catapult a revival. So among the people at that annual meeting of that district was a small group of men from Barvis, the district where Peggy and Christine Smith lived and the town that they lived in. 
So many of these guys were farmers. So unlike many meetings, you know, we've all been to meetings, right? We get stirred at the meeting, but we go home and it's business as usual. We've all been there, right? Where you come away from a mountaintop experience and you go back home and you, wow, that was a really great meeting. God was there. We had honest discussion. It was raw and real. And then you just, you get back in the treadmill of your day-to-day -day work, right? You get up and you go to work and you go to church and, and you're, you're not changed by what you heard. Um, there were seven men that were changed by that meeting. They said, God got it. We need to do something about what we heard. And so as they're discussing what they heard at their annual meeting, the, the, one of the guys said, why don't we agree to meet at least several times a week? Let's meet at so-and-so's barn. I don't know the guy's name. Um, he's got a big haymow. Let's just go meet in the haymow and spend time, you know, three, four nights a week in prayer. And so they thought, okay, this is a great idea. So seven men from that community agreed that they would meet in a small barn at night to pray for revival. So they first did their normal day-to-day -day work. Farming is a long day. I mean, they're up at probably six in the morning and working till eight or so at night. They would spend time with their wives and tuck their kids in bed, and at 10 o'clock they would meet at that barn. They would pray. They did this for five months. They waited on God, and they prayed, and they wrestled with God, and they begged God for revival, for awakening. God, we've got to have change in our islands. Three nights a week, five months, and they saw absolutely nothing. They would pray till 4 or 5 in the morning and go to work. They really counted the cost. And in five months of this, they saw nothing. Hold on to those farmers, though, because I'm going to come back to them. At the same time, let's go back to Peggy and Christine Smith. So Peggy and Christine are continuing to pray. Now we got the farmers in the Haymow praying. Peggy and Christine, Peggy, I should say, Peggy received a vision from God. It was like a dream, but this is, she was awake, but God clearly gave her a vision about, what, about something that he was about to do. Peggy suddenly saw a vision of their church, and it was crowded with young people, which was not their church. And in this vision, she just sees teenagers, like, packing the place. So she sent for her, her minister, Reverend James Murray McKay. She told him, you got to come over to the cottage. I need to talk to you. So Pastor um, James comes over to the cottage, and she began to tell him what God had shown her in this vision that, Pastor, God's about to do something. There are going to be throngs, hundreds of young people are going to be saved. Something great is going to happen on our islands, and I feel it's going to be soon. So she encouraged, here's an 84-year-old encouraging her pastor, please, Pastor, summon the elders and all the leaders, the deacons, the staff, and I want you guys to come together on a regular basis and begin to wait upon God and get ready. Get ready, because something is going to happen, but we need to be prayed up. So Pastor James and the elders and the leadership and the staff took this word seriously and they began to gather on a regular basis in the evenings and pray around a little peat fire. They would build a campfire and would gather on a, a place in the island and, and have a campfire. I don't know if they had s'mores or not, but they prayed and began to wait upon God too. So you see this kind of crescendo of prayer beginning to build. We have these two old ladies, 84 and 82. Then we have these seven farmers in the haymow in this barn. And then we have 
this one pastor out of this whole, the Church of Scotland, Big C, all these pastors, we have one pastor, Pastor James Murray McKay, and his team beginning to pray. Now, this is all being orchestrated by God because really nobody's planning this. I mean, it's God that's giving Peggy and Christine this vision and everything. At the same time, and most of these people had no idea that any of this was happening. It was all found out later. There's a high school boy. He's 16 years old. His name is Donald McPhail. And Donald goes to Pastor James' church. So he's starting to hear the rumble. He's starting to feel it himself. So this kid by himself, it's not like he had a friend that did this with him. He decides, I'm going to every day have a meeting with God at the hay bale. So he would go out to the barn on his own, and he would kneel by a hay bale, and he would pray for the high school students of the Hebrides Islands, and pray that God would do something amazing and reach his peers and his friends for Jesus. And so this kid was doing this every day. A what 16-year-old boy, you guys know teenagers, is going to go, they're on video games, right? They're not, they're not, they're chasing girls. They're, yeah, they want, they want chicks. They don't want a meal down and pray in a barn for your friends. So Pastor James comes over to visit his parents one day. And so they're in the house having coffee, and he says, where's your son? Where's Donald? They go, we don't know. Um, he's probably out in the barn doing chores. So Pastor James says, well, before I leave, I think I'll stick my head in the, in the door and say hi. So he goes out to the barn, hey, hey, Donald, where are you? And Donald yells from his hay bale, excuse me, Pastor, I can't talk to you right now. I'm having a meeting with my king. Isn't that amazing? I'm having a meeting with my king. Can't talk to you right now, Pastor. So the momentum builds. Then about this time, a blacksmith came from work to attend a prayer meeting. There was another prayer meeting. We don't even know who was at this one except Blacksmith John. But it was a group of people that began to gather to pray too. All this spontaneous pockets of prayer popping up. And Blacksmith John still had his leathers on, his chaps from, from shoeing horses and stuff, had that beanie cap, the leather beanie cap on a skull from where you stick your head in a horse's side to get their foot up and shoe them, get their hoof up and shoe them. So he's pretty grimy. He hasn't gone home to clean up because he doesn't want to miss the prayer meeting. So he walks in still with all of his Blacksmith, you know, think Carhartt really dirty. And, uh, and think, you know, barnyard smell. So blacksmith stuff, John comes in, and it, he kind of gets in towards the end of the meeting. And so they ask him, hey, blacksmith John, we're just winding things up. Would you mind closing in prayer? This is an amazing, I want, I can hardly wait to meet this guy. He rose to his feet, this little home prayer gathering, he takes off his skull cap and he prayed a prayer that will never be forgotten by those who attended. In the middle of his prayer, he stopped and he raised his grimy cap and his right hand to heaven and he said, Oh God, he made a promise that you would pour water on dry ground. And Lord, it's not happening here. He paused again, and then he continued, Lord, I don't know how the others here stand in your presence. I don't know how the ministers stand, but Lord, if I know anything about my own heart, I stand before you as an empty vessel, thirsty for you and for a manifestation of your power in our island. He halted again. After a moment of silence, he said, Oh God, your honor is at stake now. And I now challenge you to fulfill your covenant agreement with what you promised to do for us 
and to pour out your water, your spirit on dry ground. To be continued. I gotta take you back to the barn. So all this, this crescendo is building. And so it reaches now a climax point on a certain week. So we're back at the Haymount now. As far as I can tell, these, these prayer gatherings culminated in this one night. So I mentioned to you that the farmers had been praying and that nothing had happened. They hadn't seen squat and they were tired. So finally, they get real honest, and one of them turns to the others and says, Brothers, it seems to me to be just a bunch of humbug that we've been waiting and praying and three nights a week for five months and haven't seen anything happen. Maybe the problem is that we ourselves are not rightly related to God. We're praying for our island, we're praying for the drunks, we're praying for the lost. We've had so much focus on people need the Lord, but maybe, I, you know, he literally said, I feel like our prayers are not getting any farther than the barn ceiling. Maybe it's because we have not searched our own hearts. So this farmer turns to Psalms 24. And he reads to the guys. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may dwell in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. He said, I don't know about you guys, but perhaps I'm one who does not have clean hands and a pure heart. Let's spend some time and just in silence before the Lord and pray that God will reveal to us our own sin and perhaps what we need to confess and make right with God and each other. So he turned to Psalms 139 and read this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way or offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. In response to this searching challenge from God, they all fell upon their knees, first in a long period of silence. And then one by one, they began to confess things to each other that the Holy Spirit was revealing to them. This went on for hours. By five o'clock in the morning, Three of them were still laying prostrate on the floor, on the haymow floor, exhausted from weeping and confessing and getting right with God themselves. The testimony is, at this moment, 5 a.m., the glory of the Lord filled that haymow. And those seven men encountered God's presence like they could have never imagined. As a result, keep in mind, of their frustration of the district church's annual meeting, it was because of the discussion of where the church was at that these seven men began to pray so earnestly, we cannot have business as usual. And now months later, after paying a, a cost, a price of prayer, not just any prayer, extraordinary prayer, desperate prayer, they experienced God's presence filling 
their lives and that Hema with his glory. It was like, like Moses coming down from the mountain after seeing the glory of God when he received the Ten Commandments. It wasn't just the barn that was filled. They came out of the barn to see lights coming up at 5 a.m. in cottages and homes all over. Walking home and finding people laying in the ditches because they ran out of their homes because the Spirit of the Lord came with literally waves of conviction. People woke up out of a dead sleep in their beds and I gotta get right with God. That was the only thing they could think about. So people are running, trying to run away from the presence of God and ending up falling wherever they were running and in laying prostrate on the ground at five in the morning, crying out to the Lord for forgiveness, for mercy, for grace. Back to blacksmith John. They had also prayed this verse from Isaiah 64. For Zion's sake, we will not keep quiet. We have posted watchmen on our wall, and we will cry out to God day and night till he makes Jerusalem the praise of the earth. That's what these people were doing. All over the Hebrides Islands, they were crying out to God and saying, we're not going to stop praying and crying out to you until your spirit floods the Hebrides Islands and it, it, we become the praise of the earth because, not because of us, because people see the glory of God. So when blacksmith John finished his prayer, oh God, your honor is at stake. I challenge you now to fulfill your covenant agreement with us and pour water on thirsty ground. I said to you, the people that were there, there will never forget that prayer meeting. <coughs> because the cupboards began to rattle. The dishes began to shake. Their cottage was shaking. There was not an earthquake. It will reveal, um, history will reveal that it was not an earthquake because that wasn't happening in every home around. It was happening where blacksmith John and the others were praying. That, that same moment was when the farmers experienced the presence of God in the Hamah is the same moment that the, that the cupboards began to rattle, and that's when all heaven broke loose. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> yeah, hey, don't you just want this? Ah, when I hear this, when I share this story, I'm like, Lord, please, I want to see something at least remotely close. So, in the morning, we're back to Peggy and Christine. In the morning, Christine and Peggy again summoned Pastor McKay. Hey, you need to come to the cottage. God's revealed something else to us. We have another vision. And they had a name. So on the same night when, the, when God's presence visited the barn, when Blacksmith John and the, the people at the cottage had their prayer gathering, the glory swept into that little cottage of Peggy and Christine, who can't get out for prayer meetings. They're homebound. So if anyone's here and you're feeling like, man, you know, I've, I'm past my prime. I've lost it. You know, now it's just a matter of uh, wait until the Lord takes me home. You just pay attention to Peggy and Christine, because these ladies are 84 and 82, and they're far from done, right? They're experiencing, they're experiencing the best of their life yet. This is what they've lived all their lives for. It doesn't get better than this. So the two women summoned Pastor McKay. And they said, we had this bizarre vision. And in this vision, God gave us a name. The name is Reverend Duncan Campbell. And that's all they got. They got this guy's name. And he was a Presbyterian minister. A great man of God and a great man of prayer. And so um, somehow people connected the dots as to where this guy was. They contacted him and he said his schedule was full. There was no way 
he could come to the Hebrides Islands because of commitments that he had already made. And in a short time, I think it was just 24 to 48 hours, things changed and in two weeks, he was in the Hebrides Islands, Reverend Duncan Kim. And God began to use Reverend Campbell in a powerful way as to, to grow what the Holy Spirit had initiated. And so revival had come to the Hebrides. Now it was how to manage this. I want to tell you, if the glory of the Lord shows up, whew, the administrative management problem of the presence of God, it's going to cost all of you guys a lot of time. But it's a good time well spent. This is the kind of time you want to spend. So here's what Reverend Duncan Campbell was up to. For five weeks, Reverend Campbell conducted four services every single night in Vargas. Five weeks, four services a night. The first one, because of the working schedule of people, the first one was at 7 p.m. These would go on for hours. The next one was at 10 p.m. The third one was at midnight. And the last one was at 3 a.m. So every three hours all night, because of coal mines and stuff, they're working in the day in the coal mines, and at night they're free. So depending on their sleeping schedule, this was the best thing for them, was we need to have the services then. So he would finally, Reverend Duncan Campbell would be able to go home where the, the people that had come, depending on what their shift, He'd go home about 5, 6 in the morning, absolutely exhausted, but happy to be in the midst of such a wonderful move of God. Within 48 hours of the initial fall of the Spirit on Barvis, um, the bar, the number one bar in the area, which was usually crowded with drinking men after their shift in the coal mines or fishing, Within 48 hours, the bar was closed because the 14, 15 young men who were the biggest drunks in the island, who were always at the bar, were all gloriously converted on the same day, gave their lives to Jesus and had zero interest in drinking anymore without going to counseling or attending an AA gathering. These same men, these same drunks, could now be found praying three times a week on their knees before the God who had just so unbelievably changed them. They were praying for other workers and other people in the islands, other associates, that they too would meet God. It was also in this village that within 48 hours, just like the vision Peggy had, 600 teenagers gave their lives to Jesus in 48 hours and showed up at church. 600 teenagers. And I believe that that happened because of Donald because of a 16-year-old boy who wouldn't let go of God at a hay bale in his barn and said, Pastor, I can't talk to you right now. I'm having a meeting with my king. Can you imagine how excited that 16-year-old boy must have been to see 600 of his classmates and village mates give their lives to Jesus? The stories go on and on about what God did. Whenever God shows up, things change. They radically change. School buses. Here's a story of one. School buses taking kids to school like all school buses do, right? The bus driver is a believer. He's been praying too. He's been at some of these prayer gatherings. And all of a sudden, it hits him. I wonder if there are students on my bus that don't know Jesus. There's more important things to do than to drop kids off at school on time. So the bus driver pulls the bus over to the side of the road, turns on the flashers, stands up, turns around to a, a full bus and says, you guys, I need to talk to you about Jesus. 
I need to know, do you guys know Jesus as your personal Savior? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? So he begins to share his testimony and share the gospel with kids on his bus as he's taking them to school. Boy, wouldn't that be a great reason to be late? We're tardy because our bus driver just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Sorry we're 10 minutes late for our first period class. About the same time, there's a woman out milking cows. I can relate to some of this farm stuff because I grew up in that kind of community. She's milking old Betsy, and right in the middle of milking the cow by hand, she thinks, well, my neighbor doesn't know the Lord. So she just pulls her milk stool out, sets the milk can in the alley in the barn, and she goes straight over to her neighbors and said, I was out milking cows, and God spoke to me about you that you're not right with the Lord, and I just wanted to take a break from milking. I just feel like I need to talk to you right now. There was such an urgency about the lost. So this went on for five years, till the glory of the Lord flooded the Hebrides Islands like the waters cover the sea. Sorry about that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alive today. It's not, you know, 1954 isn't all that long ago that can testify to this. This is what happened. We were children. We were young adults when this happened in our islands. It is so interesting to hear Duncan Campbell will say that he went on to other nations to see the power. Oh, I should add too that the presence of the Lord was so strong in the Hebrides Islands that when fishing boats went by, any even charter boats, not knowing what was going on, not a part of the Hebrides Island experience, fishermen would fall on their knees on a large fishing boat and begin to cry out to God for mercy and have no idea why. Hardcore men that had never thought about Jesus, now because they're within the vicinity of the glory of God began to cry out to God on their ships. Where captains are, what is going on? Nobody was preaching. It was just the presence of the Lord. So um, Duncan never left the island and went any other place to do ministry without first meeting with the praying men. He would always go to these the praying people before he'd ever go off. He marveled at the discernment and the worldwide vision that many of these people had that were very simple people, uneducated people. He was particularly impressed by a guy in the village that was the local butcher. And one day he was talking to the local butcher, and this butcher was in the island or the town of Lewis, and he was saying to him, um, what's the Lord been laying on your heart lately? And he says, I've been praying for Greece. And Duncan Campbell says, Greece? How did you come to be praying for Greece today? Do you even know where Greece is? Um, no, sir, Mr. Campbell, but God knows where Greece is. And he told me this morning that I should be praying for it. So two years later, Duncan Campbell was introduced to a man in Dublin who told him the following story. This man had gone on a business trip and was asked to speak to an assembly of people meeting in Greece. The Spirit of God worked powerfully at that meeting. Gotta see where my notes are on this last. At that meeting, and um, when Duncan Campbell went back and said to this butcher, I heard about when the Spirit of God fell in Greece, and I want to know if you can go back and tell me when it was two years ago, do you remember when God laid it on your heart to pray for Greece? It happened that the butcher was praying for Greece the same day that this businessman testified that when he was on a business trip to Greece, that's when the glory of God visited a meeting. So you see, when real revival happens, it'll start with us individually, right? It starts here. Search me. Not, we all know the problems of our nation, right? 
But it's, we don't start by pointing fingers at our president, at the government, at other churches, at America, at the culture. We start here. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me, try me, know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked or offensive way in me. That's what I've seen over and over again, is when revival happens, it's when people ask God to first turn the spotlight on me, on ourselves. Lord, look at my heart. Like the farmer said, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, Lord, is my heart pure before you? Are my hands clean before you? It always is accompanied by radical prayer gatherings where people are just, hmm, they're going to stick to God like a tick on a dog. I mean, they're just not going to let him go. They're going to give him no rest. Lord, I'm going to nag you day and night. I'm going to nag you day and night till I see your presence. I will never be satisfied till you show up. Things have got to change. I'll come to you in the morning. I'll come to you at noon. Remember when the leadership told Daniel, he got to knock it off. You can't stop praying. What did he do? I'm going to go to my window. I'm going to throw it open and morning and noon and night, now that you've told me I can't pray, I'll pray with the window open and I'll pray loud. When people get serious about prayer, because they're desperate, that moves God. Are you desperate today? Have you, have you had enough of business as usual? I can see that you have. This doesn't look like pews. So that's one sign. I mean, this is not a typical church, but you guys are in great company. The most powerful churches that I have been at in the world are not in a typical building. I have never seen the glory of God as powerfully as under a, an African tree. The vast majority of churches in the parts of the world I go to today, they are not meeting in a cafeteria even. They could only dream of a building this nice. Many of them are made meeting in mud huts made of cow manure and grass and sand. That's a step up from under the tree in rainy season. The Lord is not all limited to buildings. The underground church in China has never asked me to help them raise funds for a building program. And you know why? This is what they tell me. Sister Diane, China has enough buildings. China has enough land. We don't need any more buildings in China. The Lord has promised that we are his temple. We're his church. And so we can meet anywhere. We meet in caves. We meet in the woods. We meet in apartments. We meet in abandoned warehouses and buildings. We meet wherever the Holy Spirit tells us to meet because we're his church. Amen. We're his temple. So any money you raise for us, we're going to use to build people. We're going to use to train up leaders. We're going to use to reach the lost because we don't need any more buildings. And so you guys are in great company that you've made a desperate, costly shift to come out of a traditional building into a cafeteria with round tables. Praise God! Praise God that you're hungry and desperate for more of God. This is only the beginning. I'm here to promise you. I have felt a bubbling up in my spirit, in my guts before coming here, like a spring bubbling up. Like, like God is saying, I'm about to do something. He says, I'll, I'll do things that are beyond your imagination. I will do far above what you could ask or think. Think about that. That God is positioned to blow our minds. The minds of the wildest prayers and the wildest imaginations in this room, God has said, 
you ain't seen nothing yet. If you will pay the price of prayer and humility and brokenness before me, if you will cry out to me day and night, listen, this Hebrides Island story, my Bible says God is no respecter of persons. My Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why is it that I'm seeing revival all over the world but in no place in America? Is God saying, I love India, I love Africa, I love China, I don't love you? No, I come away from trips and come back to the United States and I say, God, do we even have Christianity in America? It looks so different here. Why, Lord, does it feel and look so different? Do we have whitewashed Christianity in America? Is it Americanized? Is it westernized? Is it materialized so that we're comfortable? Because, Lord, what I see in the world and what I see at home looks so different that they can't even be called the same. I, I tell people boldly, we don't have a gospel worth exporting anymore. We shouldn't be sending out missionaries. We should be bringing in missionaries. Because we need to hear from the world. We need to... Uh, two weeks ago, there was a guy that came and visited the farm from Uganda. A Ugandanese guy. He's from northern Uganda, from the town of Gulu. This man puts up a poster when he does a crusade. Wanted. You're blind, you're lame, you're deaf, you're sick, you're dead. Bring them to the crusade and meet Jesus. That is a gutsy poster. That's not the one you're going to see here. And so I said to him, how many times, Benjamin, Benjamin's 32 years old. How many times, Benjamin, have you seen the dead raised recently? Seven times people have brought corpses to his crusades where he has prayed. Not Benjamin. Benjamin knows he can't raise any dead. Jesus showed up and raised the dead. So then because I'm skeptical, because I'm a good American, right? I have to have a discussion with him about definition of dead. He goes, oh, I said, you know, dead to me, Benjamin, you know, this is like stiff as a board. This is like color gone out of you. Not that you're still not black, but not that you're, you know, white the same color as me, but I'm talking. Stiff, dead, no heartbeat, no pulse. He starts laughing and he goes, Sister Diane, I'm educated. And he's a doctor. He said, I know what dead is. I'm talking dead. Jesus still raises the dead. Amen? Amen. Those are the people we need to have here. So I just want to, I don't even know how to end. Maybe I should end by just saying, why don't we just take a few moments at our tables? Just right where you are, and moments of silence. Let's just spend some time and say, wow, Lord. Keep in mind, 1949 to 1954. I was born in 57. So, you know, for people that in their 60s, this happened in your lifetime. Let's take a few moments and say, Lord, speak to me. Maybe you want to ask the Lord in your silent time. Okay, Lord, I heard about Peggy and Christine. I heard about Pastor James McKay. I heard about Blacksmith John. And I heard about different prayer gatherings. Lord, what are you saying to me? What's my part? I want to add to Besides Pastor James McKay, were, were any of these people anything special? They were common people, having ordinary jobs or lives, some senior citizens. As far as we know, there's not Bible degrees here. There's not educated people here. There's not seminary apart from Pastor James McKay. These are ordinary people that are pressing into God and asking the Lord for visions, for his word for them. Gathering other like-minded people. Just ask the Lord, Lord, is there something you want to do through me to bring revival to the Twin Cities? Something you want to do through me to bring revival in my family? Maybe you have lost family members. Lord, what is it that I need to do? Maybe you're not going to pray for your neighborhood. Maybe you're going to write down the names. 
of every aunt, uncle, cousin, niece, nephew. And you're going to begin to pray for your family by name every day. Lord, change my family. Whatever that is, let's just spend some moments. Let me pray and then let's just spend some moments in quiet. Holy Spirit, come and do what you do best and speak to each person individually. Right now, I ask that you would quicken scripture. Maybe there's a verse that will just pop into different people's minds that will be, this is going to be my stake. Maybe you'll give a vision. They'll see something that they have not, everybody's awake, we're not falling asleep dreaming here, but you'll give people pictures in their minds. They'll have a picture of something that's crystal clear to them. I ask that you would do that. You'd put a certain name on their mind, a certain person. Holy Spirit, just in every single person that is in this room, do something unique. Your word is clear, my sheep hear my voice. And they will not listen to the voice of another. I'm the good shepherd. So thank you that you're speaking today. Thank you that you have ways of getting through to us. Most of all, I pray that you would arouse in us a thirst for living water to be poured out on our lives, on our families, on our church, on our community, that you would give us a thirst that cannot be quenched until we encounter you, the only one who can satisfy that thirst. I ask this in Jesus' name. So let's just take a five minutes or so of just silence in the Lord's presence. 